Good morning, hucksters. It is my favorite day of the week. That is Tuesday, and we get to talk to another cool person doing awesome stuff with hardware. This week, we're talking to Adam Taylor, who is a longtime friend of Hackster. We work together a lot, Adam. Is that right? We have. We've worked together for many years now, 2016, 17, something like that. It's, something like that. Uh, it's been a long... I should put the first project I did, yeah. <gasps> yes! Uh, while you talk, while you talk, I'll go away and look at what the first project I ever did for Hackster was. Yeah. Yes, cool. Well, in the meantime, you know, we've we also collaborated on this. Uh, I say we collaborated, but it was mostly you uh, on this FPGA des design essentials. <laughs> FPGA design essentials. Good morning, uh, class, where you did a couple of lessons uh, on different ways of um, designing FPGAs, and that's sort of like what you're known for. Uh, at least these days, is uh, FPGA design, FPGA contracting, and teaching people about FG FPGAs, which is very cool. Um, and has been kind of really being popularized in the last couple of years. So I'd love to hear from you just a quick uh, description for those who aren't familiar yet. What are, is an FPGA and what are they used for? Oh, so what is an FPGA? That's a good question. So I mean, it's an FPGA really is just a collection of logic gates. So it's it's a number of logic logic gates that are organized as a, essentially as lookup tables and storage elements. That's how they started out. Uh, you know, they have more these days, they have more things in them like, you know, block RAMs, DSPs, processors even. Um, and they're quite, they're used for things where you want to do high performance processing or power load processing, or you have some sort of systems integration, systems integration tasks. They also, I guess they also have a bit of a thing where when a when an engineer says, I'm going to use an FPGA, the project manager generally puts his head in his hands and starts <laughs> crying as he sees his projects and budgets and timescales moving out. Because <laughs> uh, they're not always the easiest to get to, you know, they're, they're, you're programming at a lot lower level uh, than you are within like sort of a standard microcontroller or something like that. Although the the tools you know the last few years have got absolutely fantastic in sort of allowing you to work at, at higher levels as you as you go through it cool and you've started a group uh, a company called aduvo engineering and i don't know enough to know off the top of my head what that means but i do know it's latin does it mean it I'm means arriving it means to help aid and assist apparently oh, it did according oh. to google when I, when I set it up it's the last time I ever named a company up after something, trying to be something smart <laughs> on, uh, on, on a Duvo. But no, it's, yeah, we've been going a fair while now, since sort of 20, 2014, I think, it officially wow. was the company started. Uh, in fact, actually, it was the four, I think it was like the 14th of December, 2014. So it's nearly, uh, nearly it's eight, eight, eight years. Uh, nice. And it's, yeah, it's, it's gone really well, to be honest. We do. I never, I never dreamed it would be this successful. Actually, you know, I always envisaged it would just be me, you know, working, uh, working on it. And now we have a couple of, I have a couple of people working with me, and I have a, uh, not out, they're not in the office today because uh, it snowed in the UK recently, huh? uh, which which means it's like disaster. You know, we have like two <laughs> inches of, we have like two inches of snow, and the UK is sort of now preparing for Armageddon. Uh, so everybody's everybody's sat at home. That's how it uh, goes. We have a. We have a graduate engineer and a, and a really se really senior experienced engineer that joined me in the in the summer I've known for sort of ten years or so. Mm. Uh, so it's been it's been great, and we we've, we've had some really cool contracts as well uh, over the years, and uh, worked on some really quite cool things. So, Anything you can talk about? Oh, lots we can talk about. You know, we do a lot Ooh. in the we do a lot in the we do a lot in the space industry. Mm -hmm. uh oddly enough for a little company we do quite a lot you know we've <laughs> we're just wrapping up a contract with european space agency where we've yes. been looking at where we've been looking at some of their fpj ip uh so so that's so they have like an ip library for fpjs that they use uh, and we've been looking at the quality of one of the projects we've been doing is been looking at the quality of that and sort of uh, examining it and trying to find out if there are any issues with it or, or not uh we also have some other projects with sort of uh European Space Agency were involved with the Plato project as well. Yeah. Uh, so, which is a sort of a planetary oscillations to go find new new planets. Uh, so, so we're cool. we're involved with the design and development of not only the FPGAs for that, but actually the uh, some hardware elements for that as well. Um, so we're we're just 
touch wood. I have a simulation <laughs> running that hopefully is going to be the end of this project, uh, or the end. You know, so we're getting we're getting quite close to the quite close to the end of end of that. Now but we've done developed three different types of FPGA, three different FPGA designs for that uh, for that for that mission. Wow, and that's uh, supposed to go live in twenty twenty six. I think the launch date is about 2026. Yeah, I think the launch date is You said there's some hardware elements that you're developing alongside the FPGA. So we, yeah, so we've been involved in uh, part of the, the, right at the front, you can see the uh, the cameras on the front. Wow, that's a camera uh, array? That's a camera array. Oh. Uh, and we, we've, been, we've been involved by some other companies, you know, where, where we're quite way down the food we're quite way down the food chain you know uh, -huh. uh but but we've been involved in developing the three different well actually five different types of circuit boards and three different types of fpgas to actually keep those cameras at, this, at a constant temperature oh. so if you think about it it's kind of like the world's most expensive thermostat like you have in your house <laughs> And how do they do it? Do they do it with Peltier cooling, or are they no? The heat it's to... actually actually the, actually the challenge is actually so there's no Peltiers involved because actually space is quite cold. Right, um, of course. So the uh, we're actually heating up. We're not, we're actually heating. We're actually heating up to back to about minus a hundred. Huh. Uh, not 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 cooling not not uh, not cooling down. So normally it's it's quite space electronics is quite interesting because. Normally, the challenge is the opposite of what you think it is. Because <laughs> normally, normally the challenge is keeping the device, stopping the device from getting too hot. Mm -hmm. Because you have them, you know, they're sealed in a, they're sealed in an electronic box. There's no, uh, there's no con, there's no convection or or, uh, or radiation. There's only conduction to pull the heat out of the circuits. So normally, a really good interview question for people designing electronics and things for space is sort of, you know, what's going to be the challenge. <laughs> and everybody always thinks, oh, oh, space is cold, so it's going to be sort of, you know, we're heating it up. Actually, the challenge is the opposite way. It's stopping the electronics from getting so hot that it begins to uh, destroy itself or, or damage, its, damage its reliability. But in this case, because it's actually sort of space, because the cameras are actually space facing, obviously, they're, uh, they're, actually, quite, they're actually quite cold. Uh, oh, so it gets, that makes sense. It gets sort of heated, it gets sort of heated up. Um, so and, uh, do they so use we have a very... Or? Exactly that, that, that. That's exactly it. Resistive, huh. resistive elements to sort of heat it up. And we have a very unique. My my good friend Barry um, Barry Cook, who uh, I do a lot of work with, uh, he came up with a very unique analog front end to do the to do the sort of the precision to the precision measurement uh, because you don't want any sort of dark current or anything like you don't want any you know noise or anything like that in the images that could that could come from uh, oh. thermal gradients across the across the plate. Right, because a lot of these, um, I just was learning about the, I think it's the James Webb Space Telescope is doing everything in infrared, right? So it's all about yeah, that's, heat. Yeah, that, that's that's an infrared. Yeah, that's that's quite cool. The James, the James Webb's just fantastic. It's just, oh, it's so pretty too. They made some gorgeous posters amazing. for that one. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's an amazing piece of, it's an amazing piece of engineering. It's. Um, it's it really it really is Com you know it's and it's taken years to come to fruition that's so that's one of the weird things with like space projects is they take forever to come to you know to come to fruition right. to actually get to being on the launch pad or to actually even to actually even get to having hardware you know or, or starting doing testing or commissioning you know it can be many years you know people can spend like five or ten years or maybe even longer sort of writing proposals proposing missions you know then doing the engineering the systems engineering side there and getting funding to move things on like it's a it's a very long sort of a very long process from from the that initial hey let's do this to the sort of the launch and the concept of it yeah so i've got a question for you uh this is one we often ask, but I'm curious about your story, how you uh, became the Adam Taylor that you are today in terms of uh, your interests and uh, your schooling. And were you, did you go to school for this? Were you uh, self-taught? Did you, I don't know, did you have inspirations? Uh, it depends how far you want to go back, really. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, I, got, I got into engineering in a bit of a weird way. Um, I, my, my, so in the UK, you go to school to, well, you used to when I went anyway, you know, you go to school till you're about 16. And at 16, you do what they call GCSEs, which is sort of like standard school leaving exams. And you do quite a few subjects in that. 
And then normally you go on to college, which covers your sort of, which is like further education, which is sort of 16 to 18 and you do A-levels. Mm-hmm. And at A-levels, you do a couple of subjects, like maybe two or three subjects. And then you go to university. You know? So like you do your A-level, you start to specialize in what you want. And then you go to university and do it even further if you, if you like it. So my A levels are in history, geography, and general studies, which yeah. is quite un- which is quite unusual for an en- which is quite unusual for an engineer. Mm. Uh, in reality, they were in actually going to the pub and drinking. Uh, <laughs> I, f- I failed them quite disastrously. So the drinking oh, no. age in the U- the drinking age in the UK is eighteen, I should say. Mm. Uh, so I could get when I was sixteen, you could you could kind of pass for eighteen and go to the pub. <laughs> uh, so I didn't do very well in them. I got like two D's and an N or something. So like the grades are like A to A to F, I think. A being the highest, F being the lowest. Um, I got two Ds, which is appalling, and it, uh, which is like we're not even going to grade this paper. Oh, it's, so oh no. it's like you should really have studied. Uh, but it was quite. It was actually the best thing that ever happened to me because it it kind of led me down the route of uh, moving into engineering. So I did uh, I did an access year, uh, like an additional year on an engineering degree, where I did all the maps and the science and everything that should have been uh, should have been on the engineering so that I should have done if I'd done. Uh, sensible A levels, uh, and then I then I did a I ended up going to a, a university to do electronic engineering, and uh, uh, I went from failing my A levels to graduating pretty much top of the class in um, in the in uh, in the degree, uh, and then I just started working as a working as an engineer really, and sort of did the traditional things you know, designed circuit boards, FPGAs, moved up to management, got quite high in management, and then decided I didn't like this, and then set my own company up but i also did the blogging thing on the side as well which was really sort of uh, started writing about fpjs in 2013 and that sort of had a profound impact and changed my life and that's why we're sort of sat chatting now yeah oh there's so much interesting stuff here i think that uh it's really cool when people come to a, a tech the tech world having had some grounding in other fields and obviously you, it doesn't seem like you necessarily applied yourself too much to those but like also there's this thing of where um Apparently, apparently it's misattributed to Einstein, but there's this idea that, you know, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, then like, obviously you're going to end up in the wrong thing. But it seems like you were kind of like, maybe a fish trying to climb the, the tree of history and geography. And then, yeah. oh, actually, I don't know. Maybe that's an over simplification. No, 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 it was like the history of, I did the history of the, at A level, I did the history of the Industrial Revolution. Wow. So sort of like 1750 to 1875 when mm-hmm. the Industrial Revolution was going up. And there was, it was political and political and socioeconomic history of that sort of change. I mean, it was really interesting. Mm. Looking back, it was really interesting. At the time, I was like 16, 18. I was like, oh, dude, this is so dry. This is like, you know. <laughs> um, but it was, it's good. But I think generally in life, somebody once told me you have to find what makes your heart sing. And yeah. sort of engi- engi- engineering just just does that for me, and particularly the FPGAs. What do you find so uh, inspiring about them? I think it's the fact that you can. They're, they're so flexible. You know, you can do, you can do anything you want with them, um, and you can use them across a range of applications. You know, not only like, we'll talk about the space stuff today, obviously, but mm-hmm. I mean, throughout, throughout my career, I've, I've put FPGAs into really, you know, a wide range of applications from sort of. Uh, air, you know, aircraft to defense to sort of radars and space, of course, to industrial things to autonomous self-driving cars, uh, and they're just so you know they're just so very flexible and and, and useful that you get to, you get to use quite a lot of um, quite I guess they're just sort of so useful that you put them in a lot of applications and you get a a wide range of interesting things and. They are one of the last areas of engineering that's quite exciting as well, because you get to be a little bit creative. You know, if you're designing a board, then you're just putting a processor down and some memory and this and that. And the other mm-hmm. words, with an FPJ, you're kind of still defining the logic gates and, and the solution. Mm, yeah. So you kind of get be, uh, to be involved at all stages of that process. Um, I think it's really cool. I hope that this comes through to you. Um, Speaking of school and also of inspiration, you're working with some colleges uh, with this new board that you've made uh, with Raspberry Pi that uh, you just showed me just now. And I'd love to hear a bit more about that. And I think it, yeah. it's probably something that's really inspiring to them as well. So we have two, there's, there's two slight, there's two slight things. I, really. I mean, the first thing is, like I say, college in the UK is sort of 16 to 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have a local college. I live in a town called Harlow, 
uh, in Essex. It's a, this is kind of like a post-industrial town, you know. Uh, and we have a um, we have a local college at Essex and Trading years old. And I reached out to him maybe two years ago now and said, hey, why don't we teach the kids that are doing sort of like engineering uh, how to build a CubeSat? And let's build a CubeSat and, you know, try and take a picture of the UK from space. Initially, people mm. said, well, let's try and take a picture of Harlow. And I'm like, I think that's a little bit of, a little bit yeah. of challenging. Uh, maybe if we could get one of the Earth, that'd be brilliant. If we could get one of the UK, then that'd be, that'd be even better. Uh, so we've been for the last sort of year or so now, and we're into the second the second year of it. We've been working with a, a group of students at uh, at the local college, and there's, there's not just me involved. You know, there's uh, there's H Harlow Council are involved. You know, they've put some money into oh. Harlow College. My my friend um, David Whale at uh, Thinking Binary is a software engineer. He's been involved with it, um, and we've been teaching these. We've been teaching them to sort of like go for you know, well, what are the challenges to get to space? You know, what are the challenges that you might think about and see in space and uh, how, how would you do this and then we've been generally sort of walking through sort of would you pick it you know how you would you take a picture so get an image sensor we'll be using a um the raspberry pi pico the the plan eventually is to build some custom hardware but we'll be using the raspberry pi pico to get sort of started with and we've got that connected up to you know over the first time we've got that connected up to uh, sort of the cameras and, and running that and then once you get the pictures out of it you're like okay so now we want to transmit the pictures so then we'll we've got them looking at sort of uh, RF modules that connect to the Pico and send the data down to a ground station. Um, and we're just starting to sort of work on creating some little circuit boards based around the Pico, uh, up with the Pico on it at the moment, so as we can get them to think a little bit about like sort of the, the more interesting things in space, you know, like shock and vibration and, mm. and, and temperature and, and, and things like that. And probably their boards might fall to bits, but it'll be a bit of a learning experience <laughs> for them as to why, you know, they can't be the only ones that don't get stuff falling to bits. You know, we all, we all, we all get it over the time when it goes through it, but it, it's, it's really quite, it's really quite cool. And we've been teaching them sort of, um, you have to stop me if I'm rambling. Oh, we've I been just teaching have, them, yeah, we've been teaching things like, you know, like, mm. like edge impulse and things like that to do image processing on the little Raspberry Pi Picos and things. Mm. It's been really, it's been really quite a powerful sort of, uh, good thing to get to get them to get them going with you know and uh, and to to get them up and uh, to get them up and running with that's super cool okay so the reason i just freaked out there is because uh, you mentioned that you know probably their ball boards will fall apart because you know it's their first time doing this and i'm really curious what are the sort of main reasons that something might fail in space is it like a temperature thing is the metal going to get brittle and or like hey. you mentioned shock it it depends actually space is quite benign once you get once you get up there it's actually, you know, getting getting there is quite a challenge. Once you get up there, it's actually not. It's actually relatively benign. You know, obviously you've got you've got radiation, which is the main thing everybody thinks about. You know, the, the oh, bit yeah. and such like, which can sh which can change your performance. But as long as you select your devices sensibly, then that's not going to be a huge issue. There's another effect of radiation called total ionizing dose, which can change parameters of the semiconductor, so it, it gets a little bit slower or it takes more current. And again, there's those can be de those can be designed those can be designed out because really when you're designing for sort of space or any high reliability application you're trying to design out sort of you know any systematic failure or any any systematic failure or any random sort of failures and then you, and you're trying to do that by introducing sort of avoiding it or putting tolerance in it but the real interesting stuff is sort of like the launch you know and it depends it depends on the launch whether you have to be turned on or to whether you have to be operating um. the launch or whether you're turned off and you just have to survive it uh, but in, in the launch, you'll obviously you'll see vibration. You'll see the vibration from the from the launcher as it's going up. You'll see um, it gets quite loud as well. Obviously, rocket engines are quite loud, so the sound waves will sort of go out and then they'll reflect back onto the launch onto the launcher as well and create more sort of random vibration. And hmm. and as it sort of as stages release, you know, you'll see um, you'll see uh, acceleration and shock events occur occurring to them, which might which might cause which might cause issues. And then, of course, obviously, you've got the you've got the temperature side of things, and we spend hours doing design analysis for the boards to make sure that the temperature's right. Uh, but generally, things generally sit at about 20, 25 ish degrees C, something like that, on a on a well designed satellite bus. It's only it's only done for the like the the the, the startup and the startup and the failure conditions, you know, when things could go wrong. But it has to survive the wider the wider temperature range for. Cool. Um, I'm definitely going to make a little snippet of that so that people can come back and learn more about that. Um, 
we've got your hackster page up here and you mentioned a minute ago that you were going to go and look for the first project you ever uploaded it's the first one i did i think was in 2018 the 21st of the 21st of march 2018 i think wow. and over, you've got over yeah. 100 projects so it's going to take us a while to get down there unless yeah. you've rearranged them no i've not <clears throat> I've, I've left them i've left them all in i think they're all more or less in chronological order motor control thing looks so cool Is it this guy? That's the one pink programming on. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to pull up my admin thing here. There we go. Put your admin thing. That's it. You have to give it more stars and more respects, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need, I'll respect that one. <laughs> yeah, tell us about this project. Oh, that's another. That, that was using pink, I think. Uh -huh. That was using. So Pink's one of the best frameworks that there is for sort of FPGA design, for, particularly for socks, where you've got the ARM process controls and the programmable logic. Pink allows you to work with it in Python. I'm sure you've I'm sure you've seen it. It's really it's really quite mm -hmm. cool, uh, and it's the most makes FPGAs really accessible. I think I think Xilinx should really say we sock board with a pink image. You know, just just put that out there. Mm. I, tell, I tell them that I tell them that all the time whenever I talk to them. I'm like, yeah, do this. Um, but yeah, I mean, this one, it's, I think there were a couple of them actually followed it around that time. So that one was just sort of how to get up and running on the, uh, with the pink board and uh, actually on the RDZ7, which is the same as the pink uh -huh. board. There's another project that came out a couple of weeks after, which looked at sort of image processing and doing sort of Sobil filtering and such like on it. Uh, and that's all on the that's all on the pink board. And in fact, it's actually still that that same board, that same demo is still sat in the corner of my office, sort of ah. running away uh, as we speak. When I moved into here, I was like, I need some sort of demos and such like to just show mm. people. So on the back, I don't know if I can twist my camera, but on the back wall, you can see it on one of the little monitors, the little uh, the little one still running that same sort of oh, yeah. process. It's running that same sort of image processing algorithms and everything that. Uh, that's on that that's shown on that board there and you still use uh pink boards in your projects like up here you've got you know and the yeah. pink system we, we use honestly we use pink quite a lot we use it not only for like teaching and and, and like sort of those the projects that we use on hackster but actually in our in our day-to-day -day work you know when we work with clients we use uh we use pink with them to help them accelerate their accelerate their design flows uh and and do uh, particularly it's not something that you deploy into the field, but as part of the the, the test and the integration, it's quite it's quite quick. And a, a couple of years ago, we did some work with CERN and, and sort of taught them how to use Ooh. Pink so as they could do uh, so as they could use it for testing their components and their, their radiation testing of components. So that was uh, that was that was quite good fun. Oh, that's so interesting. What's it like working with CERN? They were very nice. They were very good. It was only a small. It was more like a small teach, teaching project that we had with them, where we taught uh -huh. that team how to do the. Uh, how to use pink uh, actually on the micro z which is not something that has an official <laughs> not something that has an official pink release for it so we built pink for the micro z uh, and then we were using uh, then we we're showing how to use how to use a micro z to do uh, you know create custom overlays and signal processing and things they, they want to they have a lot of um, components that need radiation testing uh, so when you do radiation testing of components you want to be able to stimulate it with sort of real world uh, signals and then you want to grab the data then in some cases depending on what it is you want to grab the data back and analyze it to prove that it's still working as you intended uh, so pink was quite a good uh, quite a good framework for doing for doing that so they were they were using pink for that cool you mentioned the micro z series and you've also done some recent work with the avnet z z z u1 cg board and the click interface um what's your experience been with that and uh, can you tell us a little bit about this post yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a really nice board where, just like we did with the, how we did with the Mini Z and the Ultra ninety six, we're actually creating a little three day course for the. Uh, oh yeah, cool. ZU one ZU one board, so it's going to look at like the hardware, the software, and Ped Linux. Uh, and as part of that, we've been playing with the board and trying to uh, trying to work out and get it up and running. So we did a we had a look at it the other day running the. Uh, I mean, we've got most of the stuff done actually now. But we were we were playing with the click the click interface on it and just getting those are so cool up and running on it. it's really cool and nice i'm quite liking the syzygy interface on it i think yeah. i think next year we're going to be doing something and taking a look at uh sort of like signal processing with with the zu1 and the and the syzygy uh and mm. doing and doing that maybe 
if you're familiar with the RF SOC, uh, we were we were joking. We were talking about doing like a a a, a, a simple a, a, like a simple RF type solution based around an application based around the uh, ZU one board. Uh, just, just so you could so like you know you can generate waveforms and capture it and do the FFTs and and, and or do some filtering and, and such like. Uh-huh. So classic think, FPGA. Think stuff. Gonna be, yeah, really, just classic stuff that you use an FPGA for. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'd love to hear you more about your space adventures. Uh, in case everyone missed it, because I didn't say it, uh, it is Space Month on Hackster, so we've got all this different content that we're featuring, and that's part of why we've invited Adam on this week. And so you've uh, worked on the Plato mission that you ta- taught us a bit about, uh, but also NASA's Artemis, which is getting a ton of press. Uh, so is your um, technology going to the moon? So not not on the current uh, not on the one that went the other day or well came back the other day. So we're involved in the uh, lunar gateway, which is the space station that's going to orbit the moon. So not only is it going to the moon, it's going to actually it's going to actually stay there. Uh, so we're again we're designing some FPG we're designing an FPG and designing actually the circuit car for that as well uh, for, for 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 part of uh, part of a European experiment in in radiation uh, that's going to be on going to be on that gateway, and then we're uh, so yeah, we've been working on that for maybe twelve months or so now, eighteen months or so now. It's one of those classic space projects that I swear the the, the customer came to me and said, "We've got to do this in six months, <laughs> and if you don't, and you've got to sign all these liquidated damages that mean you'll if we, if you don't deliver that you'll I'll you know you'll pay us lots of money." Wow! Uh, and, and and here we are, twelve months later, uh, still working, still working on it because things just get slow and you know. <laughs> But it's it's quite uh, it's quite cool. Uh, it's um, and I bought a Lego set. I was I was I was, I was, I was out with my son shopping somewhere, and I saw this Lego, uh, and I turned around and there was a Lego there was a Lego thing of like the uh, the gateway, and I was like, I have got to buy that and build that it. And so then cool. I went and, then I went and told everybody I was working with on the project, and everybody I think everybody went and bought one of these Lego gateways. <laughs> so, so I think I think I'm due some commission from Lego for uh, for selling that one. That's awesome. None of my projects have anything to do with I have like a Lego set associated with them. That is so cool. I, um, we're, we're, we're only such a small. We are such a small tiny party. <laughs> we are just a circuit board and an FPG. You know, there's there's many other much cleverer people and much you know much bigger people working on it. But it, well, it's cool. It's cool to be involved with it anyway. Anyway. That's part of what's so cool about it, I think, is that it's like a ton of different people coming together from dis- different disciplines, working on different parts of it, and putting it together into this glorious uh, entire uh, project that ends up in space. Ah, so cool. Um, when working with, uh, I assume that there's a lot of you know, sort of legacy knowledge, generational knowledge in these institutions that you're working with, and are there things that uh, surprise you that to have learned uh, from their previous experience? building stuff to go into space i know that you have before as well too but like uh anything that came up that you're surprised about there are there are there are some i mean, it's, it's quite interesting because we work with two we work with two types of customers we work with like the big institutional ones like the european space agency nasa and then we work with sort of the new the newer space companies uh and it's quite interesting to see the difference between the between the two <laughs> and how they and how they go about you know how they go about how they go about doing things and their uh and their and their um so I guess their their sort of views on on sort of cost and risk and and development. Uh, so I mean, there's a lot of there's a famous there's a famous quote, uh, and I gave it I gave a keynote the other week in in Stockholm, and I I, I kind of stole this a little bit because there's a famous quote from a from a chap called uh, uh, who works at uh, Co- who's uh, at Cobham, uh, who did some uh, research into the European Space Agency and why some F- why some uh, satellites failed in orbit. And his quote is that FPJ should be banned in space until designers know how to use them. <laughs> uh, and, I, and, I, and I sort of plagiarized that a little bit at this keynote and said, actually, FPJ should probably be banned until we know how to use them. Um, <laughs> because it's quite a it's quite a challenge. So there are it, it's quite interesting to see how these things are developed and the, and the you know the processes that are that are that are involved. It's really you know it's really quite an onerous. Um, quite a, an onerous process to go from the beginning to the end. There's a lot of, um, in anything that I've done, you know, designing circuit boards or um, FPGAs or, you know, being the engineer that's responsible for an overall uh, sort of payload or something like that, 
into the space industry, the one thing that you always get is just how much paperwork is involved and how much design oh, analysis yeah. is in, is involved, uh, which makes it really quite uh, really quite interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was exactly you were building for Plato? Because uh, I read this little blurb yesterday uh, about like it says that you were developing a breadboard and I've never heard of a breadboard being anything other than like a perforated piece of plastic with a bunch of connections in it. But you're talking so about we, having... So we actually did the, that, that was actually slightly out of date. I, I never actually, oh. uh, I must go back and do it. So I, when I wrote about that, we, we were developing, so I said that we were doing the PL, the play, play, we were involved in the payload in space unit. So that's actually 15 circuit cards uh, with uh, three different designs and three, uh, three different designs and three different FPGAs. And there's a, there's a backplane and some power supplies in it. Uh, but the breadboard that that's talking to actually is a, um, we took each of the, we took each of the uh, different types of circuit cards. So the analog front end, the heater drive circuit and the control circuit, and we merged them all onto one sort of circuit card uh, mm. and did, and just proved out and tested the concept. So it's, uh, I mean, most of the companies would do, I mean, this is the sort of circuit card at the end of the day. Mm. The it's, hard, it's hardly a breadboard, <laughs> but that's what it was. That in, in the sort of the terminology of the sort of the European Space Agency, it was a, it was a, it was a breadboard. So they, oh. they tend to have sort of very strict terminology on, on things. So that was sort of like an engineering breadboard. Interesting. Uh, not just the, not like the plugboard type stuff that perhaps other people might associate with a with a breadboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now I noticed that you have a number of different pieces of technology on your desk. You showed me a couple of them uh, before we got started here, so I know that you have them down there. I'd love to uh, maybe just show us a little bit about each yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were just talking about the breadboard. We have another one actually, which we did a few years ago. Actually, we did this last year, and this one's. A little bit unusual for us because this one is it's quite tiny mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's involved in sort of satellite laser communications but actually this one doesn't have an fpga on it this one's got a little uh a little sam 21 processor from uh, from microchip on it mm. uh, so not everything we do is actually in the is actually an fpga but this was uh, that's quite cool as it has a little um little sam processor on it we also have we're talking about like when we're talking about the the lattice dev board and the raspberry pi pico uh, with the schools, we've just developed internally this board, mm. uh, which has got a. Uh, this is the one. This is the only one I've got. As I was explaining in the pre-chat, the rest are oddly stuck in customs somewhere due to due to Brexit. Mm. Um, we sent them out for the Space Tech Expo in um, in Bremen in Germany, and they've never made it to that. They never made it to the show, and they've never made it back here neither. So hopefully they'll come back. But we have a little lattice FPGA in there. So lattice and cobham have just really sort of like a space range of FPGAs that are quite in, that are quite interesting. Um, and it's got the standard stuff, sort of PMOD interfaces and an SFP an SFP cage on it. Yeah, is the, that the, the ten gig vision? Yeah, uh, it, it'll do it'll do one gig sort of. It'll do one gig Ethernet. It won't, there's oh. not enough lanes for it to do ten gig, but it'll do one gig. Uh, so it's a nice way to get data on and off the board if you've got sort of high data mm. wasted one of Obviously, we've also got this little footprint here might look familiar to people familiar with the, uh, and I don't have one. It does look ones. like this a is, Pico. It's a Pico. Uh, and we're quite big fans of using the Pico. Uh, so we put a little Pico on here. It's connected to the connected to the FPJ and the power management stuff like this side. Uh, and it allows you to sort of, uh, we use the Pico for, for sort of simulating system sensors. And system interfaces. So we put one on the dev boards because you can because it's got like I squared C, SPI, and you can and the programmable I/O state machines are quite flexible. Mm. Um, we use that to do, we use that to do to do things in our in our system and simulate and stimulate uh, stimulate interfaces and sensors in our systems. And it's actually sometimes it's better than putting the actual sensor on there because if you put the sensor on there and you want to inject a fault to check that your you know your FPGA is working correctly. It's difficult to inject that fault or to create that sort of fault. Whereas if you've got something that's emulating it mm -hmm. uh, over an I squared C interface or something, then you can quite easily interject. You can interject that fault or or create that fault condition to see how the uh, see how the FPG see how the FPG uh, responds and behaves to it. And we have we we're talking about the, the the Plato thing. One of the things we have with the free FPG with the free FPG designs that we've done. 
uh, is we have some, the controller on there is perhaps the most complicated FPGA I think I've ever done. In, not in terms of its speed, but in terms of what it actually does. It manages about 10,000 registers across the entire, which define the entire system and the configuration. Um, and we have a little dev board down here, which is based on a, uh, on a dev board. You can see it. So it's quite sort of hacked together, but it's got sort of like the same, it's got the same FPGA on it. It's got the same sort of memory on it that the, uh, that the flight board's got on it. And then it's got a couple of, a couple of Raspberry Pi Picos on it, surprisingly enough. Uh, emulating system interfaces and such like, such that it can, uh, such that we can test it out and, and, and prove it out as we go from sort of the integration um, side of things. Because that's that's the other thing when you're working with space, you know, and you're working generally, it's a it's a multinational effort, uh, and the hardware is very expensive. So you only end up with one set of hardware located in one country somewhere. Uh, so unless you want to get a lot of air miles, you, you need to be able to sort of uh, recreate things and sort of communicate quite well. Uh, yeah, to work, when, out what's, to work out what's going on. When you mentioned uh, trying to inject a fault just by having the sensor on there versus like emulating it with the Pico, I'm imagining you like trying to like shine different types of flashlights in there and like whack it upside it. And then like when you're collaborating internationally, like, yeah, put it on your desk this way or like smack it on the left side and like poke it with a like a screwdriver in this area. And, like, it's much easier to just with have me. a Pico on it. You, you joke, but we've been working with a um, we've been working with a client actually uh, to do some FPGA work, and they've got this really cool imaging technology that sits on the rocket as it launches and can analyze the atmosphere of the rocket to see whether the payload is getting contaminated. Um, it's really it's really quite cool, and we've been helping them do the FPGA and, and and giving them a bit of steering and help. But to actually test it, you know, it has this it has to detect uh, it has to detect that the rocket's launched to start doing its doing its job. Uh, and we've got some accelerometers on. There's some accelerometers on the board. Uh, uh -huh. So to actually make it work in the lab on the test board, you bang the you bang the desk <laughs> to trigger the excel to trigger the accelerometers. That's great. To get them to. And so we did a we, because we wanted to see if it worked. You know, you want to you prove it it works, and then you're like, well, will it work with the ex does will it actually detect a launch? Uh -huh. So then you're like, well, if we just program them to program the accelerometers to have a very low level before they generate the interrupt, let's just try and see if the low, sort of the logic works. Uh, and then we've been talking about last time I saw them, we were talking about how actually do you test, do, how actually do you test this in the real world? Um, and it's funny because there's a huge big lift tower in the UK for testing like uh, elevators. Hmm. Uh, it's it's really quite tall. Uh, and we were, they were talking about, you know, maybe we can put this in the, maybe we can put this in the elevator <laughs> and then the elevator will go up because it's a test elevator. So they can like vary the speed on it. Uh, and like it, maybe it'll go up and we can sort of trigger the, trigger that and that'll trigger the launch, the launch side of it. So it's quite, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to have because you want to have, obviously you want to test it as uh, close as you can to the real world final sort of um, system and settings and make sure it's all going to work. That's so interesting. Um, okay, so moving into the future, what do you think are some of the, you know, maybe you're facing some challenges now that you don't quite have solutions for, or what you foresee some upcoming challenges that people will have to confront in the upcoming years? Uh, are there any of those that you see coming down the line and possible solutions for them? I, I think, yeah, I'm excited about it. I think to be fair, I think one of the interesting things that you're going to see is sort of like AI and the applicate and, and that in, and that falling into into space and right of course I I think a lot of people think about it as necessarily just doing sort of you know a lot, when a lot of people think about AI a lot of people think about the uh, you know the image classification you know is it a dog is it a cat or is is there something relevant in this you know is there something interesting in this field is there a car is there a pedestrian you know, when you think about the space side of things, it can be something simple as, you know, like we've just been doing some imaging of the Earth. Were there any clouds in that? You know, did we actually get images of the Earth or did we just take lots of pictures right. of clouds? And, and do we want to do it? But I think there's more, I think, and that's challenging enough that because the data rates that are involved in, in, in doing Earth observation, are, they're just phenomenal. They're, they're you know, they're, they're hundreds of gigabytes per second that needs to be captured, processed, analyzed, stored, and, and made available for download. So it's a phenomenal amount of data that's, that's needed there. But I think some of the other interesting things are is the ability to actually look at, do predictive maintenance and predictive sort of 
uh, look at telemetry data because these satellites are full of, you know, they're full of telemetry looking at like sort of voltage rails, currents, temperatures, you mm -hmm. know, system system behavior. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, I think there's gonna be some interesting work around sort of doing uh, sort of tiny ML sort of edge AI type things in space where you're looking at the, where you're looking at the batteries, you're looking at the, you're looking at the voltages and you're trying to work out whether your, whether your systems on it is happy or whether your system's got some issues and then if you do, then you can begin to start looking at what sort of um, mitigation strategies and things you can you can put in place. You know, do you downgrade certain capabilities? Do you turn equipment off? Do you turn on redundant equipment to to replace it? Um, and how how does it go about that? And it can be, you know, that can be a difference to sort of keep satellites operating in in orbit, or if you're on sort of larger things, you know, like really serious money making things like geo geosynchronous telecommunication satellites or, or even actually lower Earth orbit telecommunication satellites. It could help you having service dropouts and things like that, which uh, not are not only inconvenient but can be quite quite expensive in terms of revenue stream losses. Right. Ah, and everything you put up there costs extra. Uh, I'm wondering what types of different systems you're seeing for that, because you have a workshop on edge impulse, which is one of the things that people are doing with tiny ML on embedded systems. Um, are there any other systems that you're using or? It is, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a big fan of edge impulse. It's it's the nicest way of doing machine learning. I think I've ever I've ever seen. It's 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 fantastic. So uh, we actually have some um, we have some proposals in for next year to look at actually. Uh, Running edge impulse on some space-based processes. Oh, cool! Uh, and and running that, and hopefully touch wood, we'll get that. We'll we'll get we'll get the go ahead, and we'll uh, we'll we'll start looking. We'll start looking and, and working with that. That's pretty cool. Okay, so now on a personal level, <laughs> coming down from the space uh, down to earth a little bit, um, when you're working on uh, a project, what do you? How do you sort of get in the flow? That's that's difficult because I spend so much of my time sort of context switching between projects and doing mm. different and doing and doing different things. It's it's quite interesting as as the business has grown. You know, I I, I moved into sort of like traditional engineering. You know, I moved up and became a manager, and then actually I right. realised that I like to do in engineering more than I like doing the management. I hear that a lot. So I, so, so I set it's quite common. So I set my own company up to do the engineering. Mm. And then as my own company's grow, and I find that I end up uh, I end up doing more of the management, doing the more of the management side. But I think realistically i'm a big believer in um in systems engineering and the systems engineering in, in systems engineering practices you know it, it's not just about creating an fpg or a board you've got to you know to get into the flow of it you've got to understand what the actual system is so you've got to understand you know the, the system required you've got to understand the system requirements you've got to do the sort of the, the system architecture the interface definitions you know once you've worked out what you do with the with the requirements, you've got to work out how you're going to test and prove those requirements. Um, so I think I, I think that is one of the ways that kind of helps me get into the flow of what we're uh, what we're doing is to sort of work through it in a very systematic way, I guess. Mm. Uh, how you're going to get from the beginning uh, the beginning to the end. The projects are it's funny we have a debate often in the office quite about this. You know, the projects that I see go wrong quite often aren't they don't really fail because somebody didn't write the FPGA right or something like that, or somebody didn't design the board right. Occasionally, that obviously, occasionally that happens. But the ones that go really badly wrong always go badly wrong from the beginning when, when people haven't put enough, put enough thought into how does this system actually work? Mm. How does it operate across the use cases? And then especially how are they going to prove it works? You know, how, how do you know whether this, how do you know whether this works or not? Uh, and how are you going to demonstrate to your customer at the end of the day that it does work? Uh, because if you don't do it, if you don't do it the right way, they might turn around and say, that's really nice, but we don't, that's not a valid test or a valid, you know, or a valid analysis. Um, so the more you can do up front and put that, put, put and get agreement on it is, is actually better for, better for the projects. Mm. But that's not as, that's not as much fun as just jumping in there and starting writing code or <laughs> designing circuit boards or cutting metal, which is what everybody always wants to <laughs> wants to do. And that's what that's what they teach you at university that you're just going to be jumping. You know, they they should be saying like, congratulations, you've got an engineering degree. You'll use it for maybe thirty percent of your time. The rest of the time, you're going to be writing documents, attending meetings, writing emails, <laughs> writing writing emails. Yep. You know, uh, so among amid all the busy work, what is your favorite type of challenge to chew on uh, when you're like, oh yes, I got to do this today? You know, what what is that thing? 
for you? I honestly, you know, I come back to what I, I, I really just like work. I really just like working with FPGAs. Um, but I like, it's, I like doing the, the blog. I really love in creating the blogs and the hacks of projects and, and, and the tutorials and things like that. And the, generally the reason why I like that is because it's an idea that I have, you know, you think of an idea, you think, oh, this would be cool in an FPGA. So then you go away and kind of do it and it's not work related. It's just a bit of fun. And there's no sort of, you know, if it works, it works. If it, this one's you know, so if it, cool. If it, ah, my dog. Yeah. Mm. yeah my. You know how to catch it. But yeah. So you, you love these ones where you're not necessarily under so much pressure. You kind of get to express your, or, or explore you, you your interests. Bit, you get, a, yeah, you just got to explore your interests and you think, you know, mm. like, can, can we, can we do this? Can we not do this? You know, can we do some image processing you know? or signal processing, or in this one, you know, could we use this little radar transceiver to measure my dog's breathing? How did um, it go? It, go, it, it, it went well, yeah, it works well, you know. The, I mean, when did I publish that? When did I publish that? How oh my gosh, been? Uh, 2019. 2019, see, when, when I published that, you know, I was kind of figuring the dog was, he's got a really bad heart. Oh. I mean, I mean, seriously, you can hear his heartbeat externally with like, you know, or, or if he lays on your legs, like oh. dogs do like that. After about five minutes, you're like, you've, I love your dog, but you've got to get off because your <gasps> heart rhythm is just so weird. Oh, wow. Uh, so in 2019, I was, I was figuring that, you know, we probably didn't have too many years left with him, but he's still, uh, he's still going, he's still going. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, and he, he, his heart doesn't seem to have got any, doesn't seem to have got any worse, which is probably good because I don't think he could. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, little projects like that. And I, I love the education side of it and talking to people and, and, um, and, and trying to help people. But one of the things, and I'm not not always the best at it, but you know, I get a lot of people emailing me asking asking them for help and stuff and such like and and giving advice. I, I enjoy doing that. I, I, I don't I can't I don't generally do people's homework for them and things like that. But, right. You know, if people if people reach out and they've got a genuine question or you know they genuinely are helping, then I, I really you know I will spend way more time than I really should probably do. <laughs> helping them, helping them trying to get it because it's it's what it's about really you know as engineers we have to sort of make sure that other people are interested in coming into it and i think back to when i was starting out i, I really didn't know anything i thought i knew everything like everybody does but, <laughs> particularly when you're 20 you know everything you know everything don't you well i sure do but, yeah, exactly <laughs> everybody did. And, and, your, and your parents know nothing you know the older you get it's amazing how little your parents know <laughs> It's but but it's it's sort of you and then you think about the back you think back about the people that had an influence on your career and you know took the time to actually sit with you and talk to you and explain to you things and and sort of set you up I guess for for future success. So I think it's I think it's our I think it's on us to do the same you know to do the same to the next generation of engineers and makers and and people that are interested in technology. You know, it doesn't doesn't really matter whether you're doing it for a job or you're just doing it for a hobby because it's it's cool and it's interesting. You know, we, mm. I think we have a I think we have a responsibility to sort of share that knowledge and pass it on a bit. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I'm curious. Uh, with these students who are working with CubeSats, you know, you've shown us some of your boards, which are like, yay big and whatever. And when you're working with a CubeSat, you're much more size constrained and space constrained. I'm curious what your tips are for, uh, you know, taking something that you usually would design much larger and sort of packing it down into a size like that. It's it's quite a challenge. I mean, CubeSats typically are 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters for, mm. the, for, the, board, for, the, for the board. The ones you use. Uh, so it, it's, quite a, it's quite a challenge to get, to get down on there. Uh, particularly to do it at a um, at a sensible cost, shall we say? Right. <laughs> you, can, you know, you can you can you can use really advanced techniques and such like uh, in board layout and things and, and and drive up the cost and get it a little bit more. But but generally, it comes back to that sort of that systems engineering again and, and working out and being quite ruthless as to what do we actually want to do? What is our what is our objective with this with this mission? And not what's not not what's a nice to have and what what could we do and, and and scope creep and everything like always yeah projects. it's like scope but crunch. actually what do we really need what do we really need to do and how's and 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 what are the smallest most integrated components we've got uh and then you've also got to look at it from the other side of what components can you find that have some sort of space heritage um mm. because you could just take it you could just take a you could just take a for a cube set they're not that expensive so you could just take a pun and go buy whatever components and, and hope for the best or you could go and try you could go and try and find some 
that have been um, that have got some at least that they call it heritage, you know, but at least got some heritage of being flown uh, flown in over, even if the, even if the manufacturers don't sort of officially support it for uh, for space um, exploration. Mm. All right, so moving into the future here. Not like we haven't been talking about the future, but uh, I noticed on your profile you've made a few sort of holiday-themed uh, projects in the past, and uh, I'm curious if you have anything planned for this year. I also found this really cool one, which we don't have time to look at, but yeah. Oh, the binary, the binary, the binary clocks wow, are cool, aren't cool they? Cool the, the binary clocks are cool, but yeah, I, I, I actually I haven't got anything planned for for this year. I saw. I saw a really cool thing the other day, actually with two candles. Uh, I, saw, I think Ooh. I saw it on Twitter, uh, and it was uh, they called it a, a binary advent calendar. Because obviously, oh. with two with two candles, you could light or light one or the other to go through the entirety <laughs> of the uh, you know of the days of the month as you count down to uh, count down to Christmas. So I was thinking, I was thinking like next year I must do that. <laughs> the next year I'm going to do a little a little FPGA based one for that. But I'm a little a little late for the, a little late for that one. Mmm, tasty chocolate balls. That looks great. What else are, yeah. do you have coming up then? Uh, so we have some, we've got some image processing ones coming up mm. with, um, probably with the ZU one board. I think I'm quite a big fan of uh, image processing because everybody quite, everybody just likes it. So it's good to see a pictures that you've created on the screen. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, going back a little bit to where we first started with some of the uh, the high-level synthesis uh, sort of things that we that we showed, and actually uh, bringing those a little bit up to date because it's now sort of what four or five years since. So the tool, you know, the tools have moved on, the libraries have moved on, right. the capability, the capabilities have moved on. Uh, so I want to, I'd like to go back and show some of, uh, show some, of, show some, of, show some of that. Sort of working in the MPSOC area. Yeah, I think with the Z, I think the ZU one board is going to feature quite heavily over the next year. If I'm, uh, if I'm honest, I think that's going to be quite a, uh, quite a go-to, quite a go-to board. In fact, we've just ordered. Um, obviously, I've got Avnet sent me one to sent me one as a sort of thing, but I've just ordered ten additional ones for some training courses that we're going to be oh, nice. uh, creating next year, and they're going to be based around the, uh, the sort of the, the ZU one board for the processor for the SOC uh, based mm. side of it. Cool. Well, we'll be sure to watch out for that. Uh, the best places to follow you. Well, obviously there's, um, you know, there's your hackster profile. There's your Twitter profile, which we've linked below. Uh, yeah, I, LinkedIn is a good, I'm quite active. I'm oh, a lot yeah. more active on LinkedIn than I am perhaps on, uh, perhaps on Twitter. I did dig uh, through your LinkedIn a bit. It's, there's so much cool stuff on there. Uh, um, so a link, LinkedIn, I tend to connect with a lot of, uh, a lot of people on there with, um, Good so stuff. yeah, there's there's millions of ways there's millions of ways people can reach out. Just or just drop me an email if you know if you want to chat about FPGAs or embedded systems. You know that's that's what we're here for. Oh, how can people email you? Oh, my email address is Adam at cool. It's all over. Adam it's, all, it's, it's all over the internet. If you know. <laughs> uh, Google, Google Adam Taylor email. Yeah, I'm sure you can. I'm You're sure. a brave person. Adam, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool though. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everyone, no for problem. watching. Thank, ah, you. What thank a... you very much for having me. I love talking about space tech. This is so interesting, and I learned a lot. Thanks again. See you, everybody. Pack on. Bye. <laughs>